though Angie was worried about her ability to recall during exams. But today she will face the ultimate test with Radio 4's memory season host, Mariella Frostrup. We've got a few categories here and you're going to have to come up with two Latin names in each. Are you ready? I think so, yes. Herbaceous plants. Oh, Polygonatum multiflora. I've got a little picture in my mind of polygon, the poly flying off with all the flowers, multiflora, you see. What about plants that grow in the shade? Just let me think of my prompt because it's, it sounds like Arizona and it's Arizarum, I think. And it's probiscidium. Climbers and wall shrubs. Clematis montana elizabeth. Humulus lupulus aureus. Trees. Fagus sylvaticus. Oh. Cornus controversa variegata. Ground cover. Pachysandra terminalis. Veronica gentian rhodes. Um, and just finally, because you've done spectacularly well, we're on shrubs now. Verburnum Eskimo. So it's top marks to Angie, who passes her test with flying colours. Oh, thank Phenomenal. you very much. That's a lovely plant. That's a begonia. Super. According to studies in the United States, memory loss in later life is the second biggest health scare after cancer. And the bad news is, it is true that your memory does tend to deteriorate as you reach your late 60s and early 70s. But the good news is you can do something about it. I do crosswords. Um, I also do tapestry and embroidery. I surf the net. And uh, perhaps most particular and important in my life was uh, exercising my little dog. We go ballroom dancing every week, and uh, which keeps us on our toes, which is a good thing. And um, it serves the memory well, trying to remember all the steps. God, you're right. <laughs> all right, OK. Well, there's some studies in the United States of nuns which show that if they exercise their minds and do puzzles, they actually retain their memory. So the motto is, if you don't want to lose it, use it. The one thing we do know is that as we get older, we're continually adding to our memory bank, and retrieving all these moments from the past gets more difficult. Our strongest memory connections are often very personal, and they even date back to childhood. They're called autobiographical memories. Now, Professor Martin Conway has done some of the top research in this field. He and his team have been collecting memories from our volunteers throughout the day. Um, I think my earliest memory is probably... ...being terrified of a traction engine. ...riding to playgroup on the back of my dad's bike. The sirens going during the war. Age four, I was in hospital. Being stuck in a lift when I was about, around four or five. So, what have you found overall, Martin? Well, we found, for example, that on average, most people's first memory dates to when they were about three years of age. Interestingly, most people's uh, first emotional memory dates to when they were about four years of age. And so there's an interesting phenomenon there, which is why can we remember some events which appear to us rather idiosyncratic and non-emotional, as first memories often do, and not remember other more important emotional memories from childhood, which would have occurred at early points as well as later points. So given the emotions involved, why can't we remember when we're born? Uh, undoubtedly, the uh, physiological changes which are occurring in the brain during birth are ones which probably make that experience impossible for the adult to remember. You can take part in Martin's experiment by logging on to our website at bbc.co.uk slash memory. And Martin will be reporting back early next year on the National Memory Survey. It's part of the BBC's ongoing memory season on Radio 4. Again, there are details online and via CFAX, page 615. Throughout the programme, we've heard a number of tips from experts to help us improve our memory. Now let's hear from some well-known amateurs. Uh, speech making is actually the easiest of the lot. I, I do it with mnemonics. Uh, for example, uh, when I went out onto the stage at party conference um, with absolutely no notes at all and having to speak for 40 minutes or so, um, I simply remembered it as appy Vs. 
uh, A for asylum and P for prisoners and P for police and um, uh, Y for youth and, and V for victims, happy Vs. In rehearsal, the repetition is the thing that gets the lines in. You, you're repeating them time and time again and then you're re and re rehearsing the scene and running it and running it and running it and that helps commit it to memory. During the course of the programme, we've used the story of Memory Manor's heist to test different elements of your memory. So far, you've found out how the painting was stolen and you know how long it was missing for. But how was it finally retrieved? Well, it's time to find out. But we're not going to tell you. We've devised a final memory challenge which will give you the chance to solve the mystery yourself. Firstly, we'll show you five short statements about the crime. If you've followed the story of the heist, you should be able to spot which ones you know to be true or false. Make a note by jotting down T or F for each one. You also need to remember the last word of each sentence. Don't be tempted to write these down, but we'll tell you what to do with them in just a minute. Let's get started. Statement one. The other two paintings stolen in the robbery have never been found. Make a note of whether that's true or false. Statement two. The thieves escaped on the safari bus. True or false? Statement three. A security guard posted in the turret of the maze spotted the thieves and ordered them to stop. True or false? Statement four. Ed Gardner rugby tackled the thief. Is that true or false? And finally, statement five. The artist that painted the stolen masterpiece is unknown. Decide whether the last statement is true or false. You've now completed the first part of the test, and in fact, only the first answer was true. But your real task is to remember the concluding words of each statement.